All right, welcome back, everyone. It's Shalonda, and yeah, I just want to do something real quick. I have this book here, um, John Locke, The Second Treaties of Government. And I have, it's funny, because I was trying to look online for, like, laws of nature, of natural law, just more information or whatever, and then I remember I had this treaties book, and I think it's going to actually talk about it in here. But, you know, I was just reading through a little bit, just skimming through the um, introduction, um, hmm. Okay, and yeah, we're just going to go ahead and read a little bit of this and then read the part about the law of nature. Um, so I guess there was like upheaval against Christianity and that that was not, or not non-religious aspect and poli uh, political arena, okay? It says, much of the change in intellectual um, climate was produced by the work of men like uh, Descartes, whose discourse on method um, inaugurated modern philosophy, but more important was the process of science, Newton, the prince, Sapia Mathematica appeared in 1687, <clears throat> excuse me, seemed to unlock the secrets of nature. Locke read both Descartes and Newton's avidly. Um, moreover, he was a close friend of the chemist Boyle, whom he had helped with some experiments. Um, he was brought a good deal closer to science, especially um, experimental science through the contact uh, these contacts than Hobbes had been. Okay, so again, this is just, I guess, just to give us a little bit of something. Um, okay, it talks about the treaties of government, um, essay concerning human understanding, attacking the innate idea and tracing all knowledge and experience, sensation and reflection, and in the same year were published. Okay, let's see. Then it says, uh, the purpose of the two treaties as follows. Reader, thou hast here in the beginning and the end of the discourse concerning government. So a dis discourse actually is something that is throwing something off track or not actually, it's like something to distract, you know, it's like a distraction or throwing something off course. Hmm. Oh, we know that some people were professionals at discourses. <laughs> Concerning uh, government, what fate has otherwise disposed of the papers that should have filled up the middle and were more than all the rest? Um, it is not worthwhile to tell thee. These which remain, I hope, are sufficient um, to establish the throne of our great restorer, our present King William, to make good um, his title and the uh, consent of the people. Where are my, all oh, my glasses outside? Hold on, it's just started raining. Hold on one second. Okay. Oh, well, I'm glad I'm recording them like that, like that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, King William, to make good his title in the con consent of the people, which being our only one of all lawful governments, he has more fully and clearly than any other prince in Christendom. And to, uh, so this kind of bringing me back to 1 Corinthians. When it comes to, there's no other something than Christ. But, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm not religious. You know, I'm just somebody that studies, you know, the word and the, the history um, behind it. Okay. I think that was maybe, you know, like I said, if that's what's written, then it's written. Right. But again, one would think, <laughs> have their own opinion as to what, if they think that that is the way it's supposed to be. 
Hmm. He has more fully and clearly than any other prince in Christendom um, and to justify the world, the people of England, whose love of their um, just and natural rights and their resolution to preserve them saved the nation when it was on a very brink of slavery and ruin. So again, you know, it seemed like we're coming back on in to this. <clears throat> wow. It says Locke directs his political writing against two lines of ab, um, absolute, what? Absolutist argument. The first was the patriarchal theory of divine right monarchy given by Sir Robert Filmer in 1653 in his Patriarcha, or the natural power of kings published uh, by posthumously in 1680. Um, here, Filmer had agreed, no, or argued that the kings are or should be thought of as being direct heirs of Adam. So again, the fact that we're saying that they should be thought of, right, or should be, and again, you know, I don't know what Adam we're talking about. I don't know if it's Adam, um, John, well, John Adams, um, or somebody else Adam, but I see, again, that energy of John Adams in the biblical text a lot, okay? Um, with this uh, contention, Locke dealt sufficiently in his first treaties of government. The second treaties was both the first treaties of government and Filmer's uh, patriarchal uh, patriarchs um, are printed, whatever. Okay, so that's the footnotes. Okay, so I'm going to skip down a little bit. Okay, now, okay, it says directed, although without specifically saying so, against the line of argument for the abolitionism, the ab absolutionism, okay, um, presented in Hobbes' uh, Leviathan, 1651. Hobbes rested his uh, uh, depotism on consent. He assumed that without the restraints of government, men would be in a constant state of war and insecurity. They are by nature so quarrelsome and competitive that only the strongest rule will restrain them. The choice is between uh, despotism and anarchy, and this should be app uh, apparent to everyone thinking, every thinking being. Okay, so both Filmer and Hobbes uh, represented departures from traditional ways of thinking. In a sense, it was the mission of Locke to use the social construct uh, approach for the reinstatement of the ancient political ideas. He was familiar with the great medieval tradition of poli uh, politics to which modern liberty owes so much. The tr tradition of um, the tradition that government emanate from community. Oh. That's what we talk about. <laughs> mm. It's subordinate to law and must seek the popular welfare. He had learned this doctrine from his uh, reading of Richard Hooker. Uh, moreover, this tradition had been reaffirmed to 17th century controversial literature. Much of um, it seeking to answer Hobbes, Locke, was familiar with much of this liter uh, literature. Okay, so again, I don't know if I want to read any more of that, but it does say something here about um, it's awesome. He could learn the lesson that government is a trust on behalf of the people. He had contact with Hagenot thinkers when he was in exile in the continent. Hmm. His idea on natural law, too, were surely influenced by his reading of Grotius and Puffin. Uh, well, it's hyphenated, so let's see what it says on the next page. But hold on, let's see this part in the notes. I can safely um, be supposed that Locke was familiar with the celebrated treaties, uh, the Vendic. Oh, it's so little. Vindicating something, I don't know, Contra uh, Trenos, published anonymously in 1579, 
and republished in Leyden in 1648. The author is unknown, but the work um, is generally attributed variously to the Hog, the Hubert uh, Loggett and Francis Hotman, based on the social construct theory. Okay, it justified rebellion against the king in case uh, religious in case of religious oppression. Okay. And the English translation was published in London. Okay. So again, I just wanted to see that part right there about oppression. Okay. So let's go into the state of, the state of nature and the law of nature. The political philosophy of the second treaties, like all political uh, philosophies, rests upon the interpretation of human nature. Locke viewed many as a uh, pretty decent fellow, far removed from the quarrelsome, competitive, selfish creature uh, creature found in Hobbes. He has more inclination to society and is more governed by reason, the common rule in the measure God has given to mankind. The rationally ascribed to man by Locke is a uh, pervasive characteristic uh, going beyond the cunning calculation of interest upon which Hobbes uh, depends to induce individuals in the state of nature to inaugurate society by a compact after which they must be held in society largely by force. It could be relied upon to produce a good deal of order even without the sanctions of the government and to help maintain government once it was set up. This was, oh, okay, see, well, hold on. Look, that's, that's kind of like setting up shop, right? This was especially so since uh, Locke saw that men prefer stability to change. Oh, okay, okay. For people are not so easily, people are not so easily got out of their old forms as some are apt to suggest, okay? From this interpretation, the human nature, it followed uh, rationally the state of nature Okay. That is the condition in which men were before political government came into existence or would be if Hobbes had declared, on the contrary, men living together according to reason without a common superior on earth, without a common superior on earth, and authority to judge between them is properly the state of nature. The state of nature thus understood is pre-political since it lacks a common, thinking commoners, peasants, and servants, <laughs> superior on earth and authority to judge. But it can hardly be called uh, pre-social. In it, men live together under the guidance of the... Hold on, I'm trying to just look at the notes down here. Okay, law of nature by which their rights and responsibilities are determined. The concept of the law of nature is fundamental in Locke and marked one of the numerous respects in which he may uh, be said to link emerging British uh, constitutionalism to traditional ways of thought. For him, it was really an object rule, an objective rule and a measure emanating from God and as ascertainable uh, by human reason. It provided a test of uh, criterion by which political institutions and behavior could be limited and judged. Okay, so, okay, now we're talking. Okay, could be limited and judged. It was prior to the more fundamental than the positive laws enacted by the state. And it bound men or women, right, okay? Because he called them, uh, well, no, this is men, or man, right? <laughs> I'm still thinking um, Adam. So let's just look at this, read it again, okay? Fundamental positive law enacted by the state, and it bound men, okay, men, uh, to obedience to just governments once inaugurated by consent. 
for truth and keeping of faith belongs to men as men and not as members of society. Here was Locke's main solution to the problem of why men ought to obey. In one very important respect, however, Locke certainly uh, contributed to the fundamental reformation or reformulation um, of the law of nature. He gave a sharp bias, well, okay, towards individualism, all right? And the precepts of the law of nature, as stated by him, are concerned mostly with individual rights rather than individual responsibilities or so uh, to society. Under the stewards, the scale of government had been weighed heavily on the side of authority. The balance was to be more uh, than redressed in the era whose birth was signalized by uh, the revolution in 1868, I mean in 1688. And so the chief lesson John Locke learned from the law of nature was that even before government existed, men were free, independent, and equal in enjoyment of um, inalienable rights, chief among them being life, liberty, and uh, property. Among these rights, property received the most attention in the second treaties. Its protection and represent, uh, is represented as being the primary function of government. Since this is so, and since Locke's theory of property was among the most influential element in his teaching, the student should pay special attention to the fifth chapter, the second treatise. Um, its ideas loom large in the rise of middle class nations of the functions of event, I mean of governments, for Locke was modifying the dominant trend of previous natural law. Uh, thought most strikingly when he made property a natural right preceding civil society and not created by it, by merely applying his labor to the gifts of nature, man creates property, okay? He cannot be deprived of it by government, which it proceeds. Oh, hold on. Oh, this kind of like what we were just talking about. Okay. Be deprived of it by government, which it proceeds. It should be noted, however, that Locke means more by property uh, than is usually included under the head, under that head. He calls it a general name for the lives, liberty, and estates. Hmm of men in one place and in another uh, declares by property I must be understood here as in other places to the mean uh, to mean the property which men have in their persons as well as goods moreover the limit in the amount of property to which a man has a natural right to mm. hmm. as much land as a man tills plants improves cultivates and can use the uh, product of. So again, when we talk about this, it's always been about the land, okay? It's a quote that I just heard today. And we already know that. It's always been about the land. But if we can look at the land in a duality, right? If we can look at agriculture, if we can look at cultivating, if we can look at plants and a man tills, because tilling the ground is something that, again, is biblical, right? So again, I guess if you're not going to be able to do something physically, then again, they may be able to use you in another way. That could be your mind, right? Which be your uh, your north northern northern border, right? Or again, south. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, this is just basically that part just made me think about the divine masculine uh, and feminine community and those other things that are unseen that may be going on. Mm. Well, even, you know, when it comes to, yeah. Like harems and, you know, things like that over time. Hmm. These qualifications are the heritage of the earlier age when the concept of property were, because again, land could represent people is what I'm saying, okay? 
property uh, of property were somewhat less sharp and the rights of property rather less completely asserted than they would be later. The 19th century uh, noontide and the, Bor the Borges ideology, they made it possible for Locke's theory to uh, a property to be used um, by many different groups among the advocates of a wide distribution of land mm -hmm. and uh, socialist, uh, basing a criticism of capitalism upon the labor theory of value. Okay, so again, I want to get more into, well, it's only a little bit left. I thought it was going to talk more about something, really. Okay, the beginning of section 123 shows that Locke was aware that some might conclude that the blessing of the state of nature were preferable to the constraints of government. He tries to destroy this position by dwelling upon the inconveniences, which might be summed up to the lack of security and uh, certainty in the enjoyment of property and rights, under which man in the state of nature must live and for the uh, uh, elimination of which he should be willing to set up a uh, civil society. Mm. The anarchists would argue that the cure was worse than the dis-ease, dis okay? Extreme libertarians uh, can always deprive uh, support from Locke, but um, he himself believed that if the government is based on uh, consent, men can still preserve that freedom, independence, and equality with which they are endowed by nature. Hmm. To secure this end of the course, he resorted to the notion of the social compact. It is impossible to be sure if we believe uh, such an original contract had actually occurred in history or was merely using the concept of an expository um, or controversial device. Hmm. Locke was not very um, historically minded and may have believed that he was describing that he really had taken, uh, that he, what he, what had really taken place in the remote past when political society was born. He cites some examples drawn from history and from accounts of America and support the uh, histor historicity <laughs> um, of the state of nature and the social contract. But the point is not really very important. Locke based his government on consent because the uh, this seemed uh, reasonable to him, believing that believing this and thinking in the 17th century frame of reference, um, it was natural for him to justify his belief by using the device or social construct. Okay. So again, I just want to. Hmm. Okay. So again, the social contract and, uh, and Locke's use of social contract, uh, there are at least four conspic uh, conspicuous features. In the first place, he used it so as to preserve natural freedom as much as possible. Men surrender only to the right of enforcing the law of nature. All other rights they retain as fully as before, moreover, since men are by nature free, independent, and equal, see all men being created equal. So again, if it's all men, right, that just brought me back to that, then where does that leave the so-called woman, right? Which would be that group of people in general, men, women, and children, that they joined with when they left their mother and father's land to come and cleave on to the wife which would be the land, the foreign land, full rain land that they went to, wherever that would be, okay? So it's not really talking about a fetus or anything to do with your reproductive system unless it's talking about the soil or the land or the earth reproducing or birthing nations. The contract must be unanimous, um, those who wish to remain in the state of nature are permitted to do so, thus Locke hoped. Government would be both limited in its power and based firmly on consent. Okay? 
he was uh, careful, secondly, as Hobbes had been for different reasons, to exclude rulers from the contract. The agreement is uh, between free individuals, not between rulers and ruled. The former are merely given a uh, fiduciary power or trust to be exercised solely for the good of the community. Okay, so again, this kind of sounds like, like what I said was going on. But I'm just trying to see which way it's actually going, though. Because even with this Hobbes thing, just the thinking of, and I'm not, I didn't read through the whole thing. This is a book that, like I said, I picked up at an estate sale a while back. You can maybe find it on Amazon or something. And I found some really good information in here. It's just I, I hadn't read this part yet. Um, the concept of a trust uh, fitted Locke's theory of the proper relations between rulers and, and ruled better than the contract would do. Okay, so again, this is basically talking about instating a ruling class and giving like funds or whatever. For in the con contractual uh, relationship, there are rights as well as obligations on both sides. But where a trust exists, the rights are all on the side of the beneficiary or of the, com or the community. The duties all on the side of the trustees, the rulers. At the same time, the trustees may properly be allowed a wide sphere within which they may act freely so long as they are faithful to their trusteeship. Huh. Now the social contract, properly speaking, can be drawn up only once. How in the, con the consent of later generations to be obtained, hmm. to meet this difficulty, Locke thought sometimes perhaps of formal ceremonies are reminiscent of initiation amongst primitive peoples. Oh, initiation among primitive people and of some episodes that were to occur in French Revolution of uh, 1789. But he relied most on the uh, tracent consent. This is given when the individual on reaching maturity continues to accept the protection and benefits of the organized government instead of withdrawing to other communities or to the open spaces of the new world. Plainly, this is not very realistic re resolution um, of the difficulty. For men are not so free in their movement or, lo or loyalties as the world imply. A fourth feature on Locke's use of the social contract was majority rule. The decision of a going community cannot depend upon uh, un unanim uh -uh. unanimity. Okay, for this reason, Locke sensibly assumed that the, ma the majority would rule once the social contract was entered upon. But in that sense, are the free and equal minority really governed by consent? Hmm. When they must bow to the will of the majority. Hmm. How are they to be protected against a, a tyranny or of the majority. Wow. <laughs> there is a difficulty here, which is not uh, resolved merely by saying that they uh, consented to majority rule at the time of the social compact. Such co uh, consent could soon become a very unreal thing. Locke slides over um, this difficulty. Some uncertainty in Locke's use of the uh, contract arises out of the setting up of the institutions of government. Locke was one of the first writers to recognize the distinction between society and government. Now that the, con uh, the contract sets up a form of society, civil or political society, what he today calls the state, just when and how is government instituted? Kufendorf, I guess that's somebody's name, 
had restored to two contracts to answer this question in his theory. By one, society was instituted by the other government. And, the same, and some students have argued that two contracts are implied in Locke. Others regard the setting up of the governments as the first act of the new community set up by the contract. But this explanation seems to be weak. The mark of Cain, <laughs> wait, the mark of political society is government. Wow. So again, th th this is the mark. <laughs> I, I feel like this has something to do with the mark, a, a certain mark, right? Again, like if you a marked man or someone that's a uh, marked even for something. Like I said, that they already had gave money and do, did all these things to put them out there. And so again, if the majority rule, right, because everybody doesn't like some particular people that might have been thrown under the bus or exposed, you know what I'm saying, in other ways or whatever, right? Again, that's defiling, again, defilement. And it, you know what I'm saying? They will have to pull together resources and power and platforms in order to do this. I don't even know why we're even here in this book. I, but I had to find it and I finally found it and we, we're just reading, okay? Those are, so again, if that if the majority can turn against one person and get everybody else to do so, then that means that that person don't even have a chance. Even if the person doesn't even know that they're under some kind of um, watchful eye or surveillance, right? But you wonder if that same eye has been put on those other people. And I don't think that it has. And if it was, they knew about it so that they would act perfectly and do the things like this so that then they can proceed, right? I mean, I'm just saying, people going to do things different when they know that they're being monitored or, or even if they know other people are being monitored for that position. They ain't even got to know about themselves. It's just like if they're monitoring them, shit, they could be monitoring me. So then I better just act like this or whatever until this whole thing blow over. I mean, so it's just like I said, it just feels like batteries in the back. Of the same people that say they're against a certain group of people and they've been sent by or at least uh, trained or placed, right? Okay? While they place distractions on some people. Heavy burdens, some tumultuous times, right? I mean, it's the same thing. We're talking about 1700s and stuff back here. It's the same thing. Those who are united into one body and have a common established law and judicature uh, um, to appeal to with authority to decide controversies between them and punish offenders. So again, punishments, like removing some of your, you know, access to Wi-Fi or internet or, you know, like putting um, restrictions on your platforms or, you know, making sure your algorithms don't, you know, it's the same thing, dude. Or I'll expose more of your information. <laughs> Are in uh, civil society one with another, according to this government, is itself an essential part of civil or political society, and the two must have come into existence together. The difficulty is resolved if we cease to think that Locke as a, uh, a reasoning in the historical terms, he is really concerned with the inner logic of society. He is saying that the relations between men and society and between individuals and society are as if they had been a contract made between them whereby men surrendered certain rights in the term for protection of the rest. Huh. So yeah, that's almost like how I think it was some uh, news clip when they were talking about how these people get all this money or whatever when it comes to some of the, I think it was a, I can't remember what that girl's name was that was saying, I got the right to protect myself and she got like $80,000 or whatever in security or something like that. <laughs> I think she's like a, maybe a governor, somebody, she got some position in some place of power. And she tried to say like, oh, it's because I'm a black woman, they don't want me to have this security, but nobody thinks about the so-called um, indigenous or so-called black women, right? 
that are being targeted in other ways. So again, like I said, there's a way where people would have to fold in order to get into certain positions and then they can utilize their power. And so again, when you've been turned into that person, and a lot of things are going to taint you. A lot of things, you know, you, a lot of things you can't even get back that was taken away from you by these people slandering you around town. So then now, you know, people don't want to deal with you in some certain light. They don't want to buy from you. They they think that they know you. They may um, look at how you handle things and have some kind of choice as to what they want to deal with you or not. So again, this is totally. I feel like for me, it is totally sabotaged my reputation, what I've worked so hard for, and what I consider to be a form of a legacy. <laughs> hmm. Okay. And he is saying further that relations between rulers and rule are or ought to be those that exist between a trustee and a trust store and in the beneficiary of the trust the last two in this case being in the uh the same namely the community or the people okay so again i don't know this is just making me think about just like again when it comes to these trustees and when it comes to these things and people taking you in under their wing some of you may not even be aware that you've been taken into different houses you know what i'm saying um even when it comes to those three different um, antidotes, I always wonder, right? With the serial numbers and stuff that's on there, I always wonder sometimes. Hmm. All right. So again, there's some other stuff here. Again, maybe we'll go into it a little bit later. I thought it was going to be a little bit more juicy, and I thought we were going to get into the specifics. You know, sometimes when I'm reading something, I just... Because I'm going to read it anyways, I just turned the thing on to share with you guys. But I think I'm going to go through here um, a little bit and just mark out some things that will be important to know when it comes to, again, um, yeah, the state of nature um, and the laws of nature and just with land in general. And I'll just read off a couple of things. Like I said, this is John Locke, The Second Treaties of Government. Um, and here's a couple of things that are in the book in case you wanted to get it. What is it from? October 1952. Okay. It says, of the state of nature, of the state of war, of slavery, of property, of paternal power. Oh, that's a good one. We'll have to look into. Okay. Of political or uh, civil society, of the beginning of political societies, <laughs> of the end of political society and government, of the forms of uh, commonwealth, of the um, extent of the legislative power, of the legislative, um, executive, and federative power of the Commonwealth, of the subordination of the power of the Commonwealth, um, of uh, pre, 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 prerogative. Okay, okay, hold on. Yeah, prerogative. I was going to say prerogative. Um, of paternal, political, and uh, dispolitical power. I got my glass, but my glass on, I still can't see. Considered together, okay. Of conquest, of usurpation, uh, of tyranny, and of uh, desolation of government. Okay, so again, those are a couple of things that are in this book. Um, and yeah. I don't know. If I find something else interesting, I'll read it. But, you know, that was just interesting in itself, you know, on its own to see how, you know, sometimes these things are done and we think we know things, but we have no idea as to what's going on uh, behind the scenes or, again, under the radar. And sometimes we, as a community, can look at things on the surface and not really dig too deep. You know what I'm saying? Especially if somebody is throwing dirt on somebody else, then it's hard for you to look at what they're doing because you're too worried about the dirt that's being thrown on another individual so that everybody can just bury them. So again, I'm just, I just speak about that just all in fairness and just being right to each other, period. Um, because again, I, I, with all the information that we look into here, right, I see how these things happen. The rise and fall. I see how unity is the only key. And I see how, again, we tear each other down so much that it's just ridiculous. And some people are okay with that. 
And if those people are like that, then they have no reason or no way that they should be put in certain positions of power because they're gonna, it's gonna turn into tyranny. All right? So again, I'll see you guys soon. <laughs> Uh, gratitude and grand rising and take care i hope you got it's raining and i'm about to have you know sit down eat me something and relax a little bit um and yeah i'll probably come back later with something for you guys um but until then take care